My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and ICAD USA. So uh, we're delighted to be talking today with Don Wagner upon the publication of his memoir, Glory to God in the Lowest, Journey to an Unholy Land. Scholar, professor, author, activist, and friend and mentor to many, including me. My activism, a personal word, you know, my activism and our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace wouldn't be what it is without Don's friendship and wise counsel over the years. Today's program is being co-sponsored by FASNA, Israel-Palestine Mission Network, PCUSA, UCC PIN, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, Menno PIN, Quaker Palestine Israel Network, Kairos West Michigan, based in Holland, Michigan, Joining Hands for Justice in Palestine and Israel, Emmaus Road Mennonite Fellowship, and Kairos USA. And finally, be, uh, before we get into the conversation, we want to promote the book and how to purchase it from Interleague Publishing and Simon and & Schuster. And so here's the information uh, there. Don, I'm going to leave this up just for a, a minute or so, uh, but uh, congratulations on the publication of your memoir. Well, thanks for uh, promoting it. It's like waiting for Godot. There's been four delays mostly at the printer, but it will be in print uh, today or tomorrow. So inshallah, you can order it. Good. Well, I want to, uh, uh, I want to get right into things, Don. Okay. So sure. uh, um, we've had already two interviews, you and I, and, and you want to just explain for a second why your name is on the screen and not your face. Yeah. My internet is kind of unstable. I think it's my cheap computer. So uh, I have to, you know, put off the video, which is a good thing, really. So you don't have to see me. So uh, I'll have to do that good bit of this. And you'll let me know if I freeze up. Oh, there you are. Good. Yeah, I'll try it for a while. Okay. All right, good. But I want to thank you, Mike, and the, the team down there. You've done a phenomenal job. And, you know, your regular series is just, uh, you know, you don't want to miss them because they're all so good. And you're like the Walter Cronkite now of Israel Palestine. So yeah. we celebrate you and thank you. And and all the friends to come on, you know, it, it's really humbling because so many of you should be doing this. Uh and you have as much to say that's wise. Uh so I, I want to thank you just for being with us today. Good. Good, good, good. Uh well, let's get into it, okay? Yeah. Um uh, we had two interviews with you a year and a half ago, Don, as you were writing your book. Um, for those who weren't with us then, and before we talk about the lessons learned, because really we want to focus on that today, uh, I'd like for you to say a few words about your early opposition to the war in Vietnam and your early pastoral work in a predominantly African-American church and how that prepared you, how those experiences prepared you for your work in Palestine, Israel. Well, I think I have to share uh, what I was coming from uh, of a very conservative evangelical, I would even say fundamentalist Christian Zionist background and uh, apolitical also. I mean, I didn't even vote, but my father was the uh, um, head of the Republican Party in Western New York and a big Goldwater supporter in 42, uh, 42, I mean, uh, 64. So I eventually decided to go to seminary and went to Princeton and I saw all the activism on campus. Uh, so I thought, well, I better pay a little bit of attention to this. And pretty soon I began to be persuaded about the anti-war positions uh, that were being taken. And, uh, and then I, I went to a major march in Washington, DC and, uh, that really gave me the theological and the political convergence to take an anti-war position, much to the chagrin of my dad and mom. Um, and then I got caught up in the uh, civil rights movement. 
And um, at the same time, uh, I also was introduced to liberation theology, which is a total shock to my evangelical system and uh, gradually came to see the value of that. So all this was going on in the chaos of uh, my seminary career. And then out of the blue one day, I was doing an internship at this wonderful black church in Newark, East Orange, New Jersey. And I was thinking of uh, going on to do a PhD in theology at Princeton because nothing, I tried to interview several churches and they just didn't seem like a good fit. And out of the blue, Joe Roberts, the uh, senior minister called and said, hey, we want you to come and be our first associate. Uh, so I accepted and went up and did that for four or five years. And Joe Roberts, some of you may know, he went on to be the uh, pastor of Ebenezer Baptist uh, in Atlanta. And that, that congregation helped me deal with my white privilege and gave me a whole sense of uh, understanding of who I was. But my, uh, my passion for activism uh, came about through that. So it's very much a church and a God thing. <laughs> Well, that's going to, that leads me down to the first of the four lessons that you list in your conclusion. Now, we're going to get to the other three, but the first one you list is, uh, quote, how my spirituality and trust in God has evolved through the years as an anchor for my personal faith formation, vocation, and worldview. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, I think liberation theology is at the heart in many ways. Uh, another way of Jesus being at the center and the Hebrew prophets and the values of all that. And this whole theme, glory to God in the lowest, is the preferential option of the poor, of a call to those who are broken and hurting. And, and that's where Jesus focused and that's where we need to find our values. And that's what led me to Palestine uh, in many ways. And it just continues to be reinforced. Also, I've always struggled, very much of an activist, with balancing the contemplative, reflective part of my life in the spiritual center uh, with the activism. So um, that has been a struggle all my life. I don't think I started putting it together until I lost my job at the university and was so angry and upset of the injustice that I, was, I, I couldn't sleep. So I started meditating to let go of the anger. And ever since then, I start every day with about an hour of prayer and meditation and centering to try to listen uh, to what I should be doing, what God might be saying, rather than just telling God what I wanna do. So this is all part of that journey, but I think that glory in the lowest is um, what I've tried to be and to do and, and that's, uh, I, I think that's a prophetic path, which is also very humbling. You know, it's, it's not about me. It's about the mission and about the kingdom. We're, we're going to come back to the title of your book, Don, and its connection with, uh, its connection biblically. And so uh, keep that thought. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in the introduction, uh, Phyllis Bennis and William Barber, Write this. While we come from different starting points, we come together based on the call of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who demanded that we challenge the evil triplets of racism, poverty, and militarism. Then they also add ecological devastation and, quote, the toxic brew of religious white nationalism in the United States. In our conversations, Don, in the last uh, few years, I know that one of the ways your thinking has developed, as mine has, and as, as a number of us on the screen has, uh, is to think and work intersectionally. Talk, talk to us about how that part of your evolution, how Palestinian, the, the struggle for Palestinian liberation is connected with other liberation struggles. Yeah, I think intersectionality was something I've learned across time on this issue. And I really should have done more with early in my career. Um, coming out of the black church, I mean, we, I had those connections, um, but I didn't really do enough in terms of that intersectional thing. And having learned that and 
you know, my, later in my career, we tried to enlist um, Black Lives Matter, uh, Latin American, and a whole cross section of people because the Palestine case and our activists, I mean, we're a pretty small movement, but we gain strength uh, when you bring in one else around the justice question. Another piece of this though, is to see Palestine really is a litmus test for justice on many other issues. And I think uh, it isn't just a solitary movement, but it is a litmus test of international law, of faith, even ecological. So Palestine really, if we focus on how it intersects with all these other issues, and it is a test, it's a test case, and more now than ever uh, with the apartheid issues, the closing of human rights groups. So that's a whole other piece of the interest. Uh, the second lesson you list, Don, in your conclusion is, quote, the slow process of integrating glory to God in the lowest, uh, from the G.K. Chesterton poem, of course, uh, as the foundation for my vocational journey, integrating liberation theology into my faith narrative. And you connect that with Akita from the Hebrew Bible, the, the binding of Isaac, and uh, Kenosis in Philippians yeah. 2. You call this the paradox of downward mobility. That includes the capacity to rise again in hope, resilience, and new life. The paradox of downward mobility. Uh, you referenced this before. You want you want to say more? Well, just a little bit. I, I think this is really, I think, uh, the central narrative of uh, faith-based activism, of uh, going to the, taking and incarnating the preferential option of the poor, the brokenhearted. This is what Jesus really focused on. Uh, this is what the Hebrew prophets were calling us to. Uh, the Akita tradition of the near binding of Isaac and killing of Isaac, and then the awakening that God spares Isaac and you can't take a human life. Uh, all this, I think, was uh, something that I was struggling with and trying to learn. And the black church taught me a lot in this. Learning liberation theology, a new narrative of Jesus, the prophets, and even the Akita narrative, and then experiencing the reconciliation and learning about my white privilege with the love of a black congregation. And their theology really helped shape me, and it kind of prepared me for the next step of uh, taking on Palestine, uh, which happened much later which became a very humbling learning process. So, uh, and it's a gradual process. I mean, I didn't get it all for a long time, but I think liberation theology really was, uh, was the key for me. Tell us about, uh, there were, um, I mean, there were a number of people who were, who were um, you know, uh, important, in your learning about liberation theology, but say a word about two people uh, who really uh, became mentors of yours, and that is Naima Teak and Rosemary Radford Ruther. Sure. Um, I first met Naim during the first Intifada, and uh, when he would preach, he followed it when he was the uh, rector at St. George's with a conversation afterwards about the sermon and uh during the first intifada you had people in the congregation who had kids in prison uh you had activists coming and it, it became really the model uh for sabil way before sabil was even founded so they were practicing liberation theology nonviolent resistance during the first intifada and uh so Naeem became a friend, a mentor, as Jonathan Kutab was as well uh, during those early years. Rosemary Radford Ruther, um, who recently died, uh, initially was really opposed to our work. Uh, she, when we did a 
a conference in LaGrange in 1979 on uh, a new theology of the Palestinian process and land and all that, Rosemary attacked it uh, because she was, I think she was very much into the Zionist camp. Then she went and saw firsthand what was happening and wrote about it in the National Catholic Reporter. And she was uh, disinvited from, a, from being the keynote speaker for the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And Jim Wall pulled us together. That's when we became best friends. And uh, Rosemary became a tremendous epic of Palestinian rights and justice. So this, the struggle for Palestinian justice. Let me ask you, Don, uh, you, Jeff Halper, and a number of others have now begun to use the lens of a settler colonial analysis about Zionism from its inception. Uh, you say it helps you to quote, frame the critique of Zionism and Christian Zionism within the context of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Tell us a little bit about how this shift in framework can be helpful for us as we talk about this uh, in our circle of friends and in public forums. Yeah, I'm still learning and I wished I had focused on settler colonial analysis earlier. And by the way, one of the great uh, uh, Palestinian writers, Faya Sayeg, he wrote a book in 1965 that dealt with settler colonialism. I wished I had listened to him more from that point. But um, settler colonialism focuses on a number of things. Typical colonialism means the imperial power goes in and occupies, exploits the resources, uh, attacks the people and controls them. Uh, but eventually the empire is defeated or it leaves. In settler colonialism, which the U.S. is a model of, the, the occupier comes and the occupier stays. And settler colonialism is designed to replace and displace the indigenous people. And this is what we have in Palestine. This is what we have in the United States with what we did. It goes way back to the doctrine of discovery, uh, but it comes right down to what uh, Zionism and the imperial powers have done. And uh, Patrick Wolf was a great disciple of it. And uh, eventually it has become a discipline unto itself. If I had to do my academic career over, I would want that to be a central part of it. It fits beautifully with liberation theology. It fits beautifully with the Palestine cause and the whole issue of dealing with uh, displacement theft of land, apartheid, and the rest. You, uh, uh, thanks for that, Don, because I think a number of us are moving in that direction. So your counsel about that, I mean, we're all still learning, right? This shift yeah. in the framework. And so- And I'm learning from others. And it's, it's from the Palestinians that they have turned to this. You're best known, Don, uh, for tracing the history and exposing the heresy of Christian Zionism. You say that the reason for that has much to do with the theology in which you were raised. And I'm not asking you to uh, describe Christian Zionism for us. You, you've done a number of webinars and we've been around you enough that I think we get it. But what was interesting in, in your book, you, you say in one of the uh, chapter headings, you say it hides in plain sight. And that caught my attention. What do you mean by that? What, what are the signs that we should be looking for that it's hiding in plain sight? Well, I think um, you have to take a look at Zionism and how Christian Zionism, whether it's the fundamentalist evangelical version of the end times like John Hagee or Christian Zionism in our mainline Protestant and Ro Roman Catholic churches, how Zionism blocks justice and uh, it's, it's really all around us. And in the mainline churches, um, many of our theologians, a journal like Christian Century, uh, really kind of uh, uh, has a blind spot about justice for Palestine. Oh, it's too controversial. Let's just dialogue. And uh, let's let the Jewish federations and the Simon Wiesenthal Center teach us. So we abdicate the call for justice uh, we forget about the need for going and 
committing ourselves in solidarity with those who are the victims. And so often Zionism and Christian Zionism flips the script that Israel is the poor victim of Hamas rockets or whatever it is. So um, the Christian Zionism hiding in plain sight, I mainly apply to the mainline Protestant Catholic uh, traditions where, uh, where they won't go the second mile on solidarity and justice. And they allow the Zionist narrative to dominate how they read scripture, their hymnology, uh, but also their activism. One of the most important films on the subject of Palestine and Israel for an American audience in the last decade, I think, is The Occupation of the American Mind. Yes. Uh, with Sut Jolly, uh, who you just spoke with in D.C. at the last Washington Report conference. You title section six of your book, Liberating Your Mind, and you quote Mazen Kumsiya, you know, our mutual friend, quote, our challenge is to liberate our minds from notions of powerlessness and subservience to political leaders. It is nothing short of revolutionary liberation from old ways that shackle brains and developing new paradigms for sustainability and coexistence with each other and nature. So he's talking about, you know, liberating the Palestinian mind, the, uh, um, the, the film was talking about how American minds are occupied, occupied and need to be liberated. So I want you to spend a minute or two t telling us about occupied minds and liberated minds from your perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, in a personal way, I mean, this has been a process. My mind was occupied and by Christian Zionism, a certain type of theology and narrative that kept me blind to the struggle of the Palestinians for justice, even kept me blind from the racism within me, uh, my white privilege, and so on. And, and this is where liberation theology, again, the message of Jesus, the Hebrew prophets, really takes you to the core. You know, we need to be in solidarity and listening to and learning from those who are in the heart of the struggle. And Mazam is a beautiful example of this. You know, this uh, very slender, he appears meek uh, professor uh, who will continue to be arrested and inspire others to stand up to the occupation in every way. Uh, he's really a model for me of a liberated mind who isn't afraid. Uh, fear is such a, uh, uh, I, I think, such a dominant theme that we all slip into. Uh, or to be popular and risk our reputation, or to be on the right side. And appears so often the Palestinians are on the wrong side, the way they're portrayed in the media and by our government. So we need to flip that and get back to the core. And our minds, really, it's a constant process of, uh, of uh, peeling away all these different themes of, of uh, domination, racism, etc., until we get to the core of, uh, of we are all equal before God and we need to be with uh, those who are suffering and learn from them, not dominate and be the ones in control and teaching all the time. It strikes me, you know, we're, it's about liberating our notions of the Bible, liberating our notions of who God is, what God's about in the world. I mean, right. this idea of occupied minds and liberated minds I mean, really, really touches, right? I mean, it really touches the heart and uh, it, it, it gives you a framework for understanding our work. Yeah. Uh, we got time for me to give a little vignette of Mazen? Sure. I have it in the book. Yeah, where, I was going to ask you to do that, so do that. Please. Yeah. Where, where Mazen, uh, one of his many, t Linda, I think, asked him in a meeting, how many times have you been arrested, Mazen? And he said, oh, I can't count the times. What's your favorite? <laughs> so he talks about this time where he and others were protesting uh, the wall. And uh, they arrest him, and he's sitting on the ground, uh, handcuffed next to his others, and the army surrounding him. So Mazen starts whistling. And uh, the military commander says, stop the whistling. You're really annoying me. So he stops for a minute, and then he starts humming a song. 
And he goes on singing a song and so on. And then eventually he says, look, you have the weapons, the guns, you got nuclear bombs and everything else. And here, I'm totally freer than you are. I've got more confidence, joy, and you have no control or power over me. And uh, I think he got to the guy, but we don't know. But that is a liberated mind put into practice and showing the power of resistance. Yeah, you, you have the arms, you have the power, you have the might, and I have the song. Yeah. Yeah, that's a powerful story in your book. Thanks, Don. You describe 1982 as a period of accelerated learning. As you learned uh, to speak, you said, I learned to speak in different ways to different audiences, uh, depending on their theological orientation. And, and Don, you've done that throughout your career, often to hostile audiences. I think the 1982 thing um, came about because you were in a debate or a conversation with Wolf Blitzer, as a matter of fact. But I, I may have that backwards, but I think that's true. Anyway, I want to mention three groups and ask you to give some insight in how, into how you would approach each one of them. If you, were, if you were in a conversation with them, not a public debate, but just in a conversation, how you would open the conversation or, or try to, try to uh, connect with them. First of all, Jewish Zionists. Yeah, well, I haven't been very successful at that, but um, I, I think maybe I would share a little bit about my journey and then particularly what I've learned from uh, Israeli Jewish activists and Palestinians who are really focusing on justice and I'd want to say um, I'm really concerned about the future of Israel and uh, really how Zionism is leading you down a destructive path. Now, at that point, I'll get a lot of pushback. But then I, I think I would share my learning as a Christian, my total commitment to stand with the Jews always, fight anti-Semitism, but in fighting anti-Semitism, we have to look at uh, never again for all of us. And we have to focus on equality, absolute equality, if we're ever going to have a future. So I don't know. I will get a lot of pushback and resistance, but that's, um, I, I want to hold my ground, but yet show some compassion and concern for the future of of Israel. You have spent, uh, you have spent, much of your life uh, because these were your people uh, with whom you grew up, uh, Christian Zionists who are dispensationalists. How would you connect with them, talk with them? Well, again, I think I could share my experience and what I've learned. And, you know, I've failed at this most of the time, including with my own family. Uh, but uh, my mother would always say, Don, Don, why are you spending all your time on <laughs> Palestine and Palestinian justice. It won't be solved till Jesus comes back. So uh, sometimes, you know, you're just going to hit a brick wall. But I think I would try to start with uh, scripture. I would, I would try to start maybe and talk about the Palestinian Christians and how Christians and Muslims are really one people uh, who are victimized by what's going on. And I might want to tell a story or two about, say, Naim Atik and his family being run out of Bisan and losing their land. Yeah. Uh, and there would be several other vignettes like that and say, okay, where is justice? Where is God here? And then I would point to how Jesus would, what would Jesus do? Jesus yeah. would be there with them. He would be try to help them as refugees, uh, whether to get their land back or to guide them uh, in, into a more humane future. So I, I, I think it's uh, a combination of scripture, stories, and trying to get a different narrative in their hearts and minds, because I know that's what worked with me. I, I don't know if this is uh, your experience, Don, but the, the, the third one, and it, that's been maybe the most frustrating of all for me, and that is mainline Christian liberal Zionists. Yeah, 
I just preached a sermon a week or so ago where I, I asked the question, how did the progressive church become Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, white moderates? Yeah. And uh, I guess talk to us about how you connect with mainline Christian liberal Zionists. Yeah, it's, uh, again, this has been more failure than success. And I, I look at what our IPMN network and the Presbyterian Church has done uh, when we tried to pass, um, well, a series of rev resolutions, including BDS. And we were blocked by the mainline leaders. So I think in many cases, if we can have a private conversation and sit down and just listen to how they look at this as a Christian, as a pastor, and, and try to provide some feedback for them. And then again, stories. Stories work the best to get a different narrative in their hearts and minds about what the Palestinians are struggling and what progressive Israeli non-Zionists are saying. So I, I think it's a combination of those things. Um, the Bible sometimes can help. Uh, the, but uh, I think with them, it's more shifting the theological narrative and then gradually maybe introducing uh, liberation theology without calling it that, because many will say, will reject it. Oh, that's radical. Uh, but if you can just take a few uh, vignettes from Jesus' life and uh, maybe end with Matthew 25, um, you know, the whole thing of the last judgment. Where were you when I was hungry? Where were you when I was thirsty? Where were you when I was a refugee, when I lost my land? And just take it to the core with that and ask them, okay, what do you say now about justice? Give us your advice, Don. Thank you for that, Don. Uh, those, you know, I'm, uh, I'm aware that in each one of those scenarios, you started by saying, share your own personal story and the importance of stories and connecting on a, a human level rather than some ideological level. That's, that's important wisdom for each one of us because we can get, we can get, you know, tunnel vision ourselves, you know, and, and deal in ideology and theology and forget the human person we're dealing with. Uh, most of us, Don, uh, on this call up to a few years ago would have considered petitioning the U.S. Congress to be a waste of time. But there's hope now among some congresspersons who get it, right? Uh, Rashida Tlaib, Andre Carson here from Indianapolis, Cori Bush uh, and others. And yet we're seeing now great pushback, too, with millions of dollars of APAC money spent to unseat even, even liberal you know, Zionists. What issue or issues do you think might have the most resonance with Congress? How do, how do we how do we break through the political ideologies and financial captivity of members of Congress? Yeah, boy, Mark, you're asking tough questions. Well, um, Linda and I worked uh, locally in our congressional district district with uh, a person named Marie Newman. And we met with her personally when she was first uh, declaring she would run. Uh, and she was very open about the Palestine question. So we began to feed her information. She would read it and get back to us right away. She lost the first round to a very, very conservative Democrat. But then she won. She won in 1920, 2020. And uh, she became really the, one of the greatest advocates for Palestine, along with AOC, Rashida, and the rest. And uh, then uh, in the last election, APAC, through other uh, clone organizations, pumped millions of dollars into a conservative Democrat who defeated her. So we lost her. But we're not going to give up. And I think that's one of the lessons. Uh, we happen to live in a district with a lot of, uh, with a strong Muslim and Palestinian population, and we've got to get them more active. A lot of them just don't get out there and vote. So um, I think it's possible, the story that we got her elected, then she stood up and then was defeated, we can't stop because APAC and the rest are going to keep it up. 
So there are more young progressives, I think, thinking intersectionally about black, Latina, uh, Asian, and so on is important and to get each district mobilized. And uh, for a long time, I didn't bother with Congress. I figured it's impossible, yeah. so I abdicated. But I'm a little bit more encouraged to continue to get in the fight again. And uh, so even though we lost that last round, it's not over. So we got to keep it up. You know, Don, people who know you know that you're a committed follower of Jesus. Uh, but but you're also a, a church person. Uh, so many of us have frustrations, even anger at the church. Yet because of examples like the Confessing Church in World War II Germany, the, the church's involvement in civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s American South, the example of the black churches in South Africa, we also see hope in the church. So I'm heartened by the number of pin groups that have arisen in the last decade and almost each mainline denomination. So t talk to us a little bit, Don, about the role of the church, uh, the role of the church. Well, um, I too share a lot of that cynicism, Mike, and but I think um, I've gained a lot of insight from, you know, the little church within the church these movements for justice, uh, you know, just as the Barman Declaration was signed by a minority movement against the state church in Germany. It, it was those who were willing to sacrifice uh, for justice and call the church to be what it should, what it should be. So I think IPMN and all these pin groups are doing marvelous work. And to see how the UCC passed that powerful resolution last year, and then finally um, the apartheid resolution this year by IPMN. So, I mean, these take years, but it takes a, a core of people who will sacrificially study, uh, find the right way to articulate the message, and then lobby for it. Yeah. Uh, and it can be pretty unpopular because the strong Christian and uh, uh, pro-Zionist groups are going to come after you. So anyway, it's a little church within the church uh, that gives me comfort. And of course, you know, we, we, we need also the spiritual guidance and, and, uh, and the church can provide that. Let me we also have to work on our hymnology. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. and uh, go ahead. Well, I'm Pauline Kaufman calls us to that, you know, that, uh, and we know it. Our, so much of our hymns uh, just promote kind of this hard, uh, this, this type of Zionist reading of the Bible and the faith, which need to be challenged. And to get pastors to critique that from the pulpit is a far cry. But we need that. We need the seminaries. How many seminaries uh, deal with Palestinian liberation theology? or have this kind of critique. I'm gonna have a chance to speak at Harvard Divinity School in a couple of weeks. So I'm gonna to try to really talk to them about mainline Christian Zionism and how you dealing with your scriptural texts, but also your theology and, uh, and your hymnology. You know, Don, uh, uh, when I asked you before about Zionism hiding in plain sight, I thought you were gonna mention hymns there about that's one of the places where Christian Zionism hides in plain sight, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Thanks for reminding me. That's exactly right. Hey, listen, let, let me let me follow up on what you just said, uh, because all of our pin groups, right, and, and for those of us who are Christians on this call, we really do take our marching orders, don't we, from our Palestinian Christian friends. And so say yeah. a word about the, the Kairos, Kairos Palestine, the Kairos Palestine document, the cry for hope, and the work that's happening among the Christian community in Palestine itself. Yeah, it's, uh, again, here you have a suffering minority, uh, the Christians who are shrinking, but really are sacrificially standing their ground and trying to find new ways to call out to us. And I think the cry for hope that was issued by really Kairos, Palestine, uh, was say, hey, we're beyond, uh, 
we're beyond hope. We need you now to stand with us because we're we're dying on the ground here. Uh, and this was on the eve when Netanyahu was threatening to annex the entirety of the West Bank, which will happen. Uh, so they cried out, and I think the UCC responded. Uh, but it's a little pathetic that, you know, there's been so little response, uh, both by governments and by um, churches, on, on, on this urgent cry for hope. So I think we have another moment with, uh, with Israel shutting down uh, all the human rights organizations. We need to be raising hell over this. Uh, and the NGO movements are going to be next. Yeah. And, uh, and that includes, you know, you think of Sabil, Kairos, uh, but all the others who are working hard for justice. So there's a new day of suffering coming. And are we up to it? I mean, we in the West who are so comfortable. It, it's us now who have to really stand and, and, and raise hell with our parliaments, but also with our churches to see the reality. So all this is coming from the Palestinians and the core of progressive Jews who are taking the stand with them. So that's who we have to listen to and then respond. And let me end with, we really need a more coordinated global network. Uh, we had this in the 80s, uh, the Israel-Palestine uh, the ICCP, the International Coordinating Committee, that had a seat uh, as of the NGOs with the United Nations. We need to, I think, find another way forward on, on this uh, international global network. Kairos is showing the way. Uh, the BDS movement is showing the way. But we have to expand it because it's... Uh, we need, yeah, we just need to unite more rather than work in our separate silos. In fact, you talked about the urgency. Uh, I mean, it's sad. It, it, it's, it's sad, isn't it? I, the vast, vast majority of Christian congregations and Christian churches, I bet, have, have not heard of Kairos Palestine, the organization, the documents, the cry for hope. I'm amazed that when I go around and speak, most churches and their members have never heard of these things. Yeah. So, and, and it's not just that they've published them, but they've addressed them just like the, the black churches in South Africa. They've addressed them to their sisters and brothers in Christ around the world and all people of goodwill. And yet we remain silent. Right. Yeah. And I think Kairos. Confessionis. I mean. Yeah. There's yeah. There's an Go issue. Ahead. Not everyone may be familiar. Thanks for raising that. Yeah, I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, but this is the idea that uh, certain theological themes and movements and political regimes are out of bounds in terms of our confessional status. They are unethical, they are destructive, and they are actual heresies. Yeah. I believe Christian Zionism is heretical, but to get the churches now to declare it and say Christian Zionism is status confessionis. A lot of folks are resisting this globally because it's going to upset the Zionists around us. So uh, I think this has to be something that our denominations take up, the pin groups take up. Uh, this is what Bonhoeffer and the German Christians did uh, to raise this issue confessionally. This is out of bounds with our with the theology, with the gospel, with the Hebrew prophets. And we need to declare it and take that stand. Uh, it, it's kind of like how these human rights organizations uh, really wrote and declared uh, Israel is an apartheid state, a regime from the, from the Jordan to the sea. It's all an apartheid regime. And then look at the attack they got. Now Christians have to stand up and make the same kind of declaration about Christian Zionism. Don, this brings us to one of the other lessons that you list in your conclusion. Uh, and I'm going to quote it, and then I want you to react. Uh, quote, the call to divine pathos and prophetic action must be anchored in a larger vision that leads ultimately to peace and reconciliation based on justice and love, even of the enemy. 
The tension in this process lies between the demand for justice and the final goal of reconciliation among enemies. So Don, maybe a, an example or two from your life, be, be concrete about this process and the tension between the cry for justice and the goal of reconciliation. What, what does this look like in real terms? Yeah, well, first we need to be um, clear that there's no reconciliation without justice. Bonhoeffer would call that cheap grace. Uh, if we talk about, okay, we're gonna have reconciliation and we're gonna have wonderful meetings with the synagogues or with the, the Jewish Federation and whatnot, but we don't raise the Palestine question and what's happening on the ground, uh, forget it. So I think, yeah, we're at a point now where I think we, we are beginning to move more on justice and reconciliation really seems down the road, but we can't abandon it. Um, you know, I, I think we, if you note in the cry for hope, one of the advocacy positions they took is we will always fight anti-Semitism. We will stand with Jews and fight anti-Semitism elbow to elbow with them, but we're not gonna allow the cry of anti-Semitism to mute justice. That's why we have to go back to justice. So that would be a concrete way in which this would play out. Um, and uh, for me, I've had a hard time loving my enemy, particularly on this issue when you when you lose your job and, and you're really terribly upset of the injustice of it. So for me, I just had to pray to let go of the anger and, and for me, then that meant I wasn't going to pursue legal action uh, and, and try to get retribution. And that came to me through meditation and prayer. And, and that's when I really realized, you know, um, I'd be in kind of a, uh, a loop of vindictiveness uh, for years, fighting against, uh, you know, whoever was behind and I know pretty well who it was. Uh, my loss of a job, and rather just to let that go and move on. So, in a personal way, that's what I had to do. But it took me a it took me a couple of months of meditation to let go of that anger and to realize, okay, let go of it. Uh, God's got something else in store for you, and uh, I may not get reconciliation yet, but I'm going to stand my ground for justice. And then the Sabil job opened up and I had that. Uh, so God kind of opened a new path. So I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit, but I, but this whole thing of uh, loving the enemy and working for reconciliation, it's hardest. It's the hardest thing Jesus calls us to. And I think we, we have to still hold on to that. And, and I think at the heart of it is to see everyone as an equal child of God, created in God's image. And we may have a different sense of justice, but we're no better than anyone else. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Don, because uh, uh, I was going to ask you about the price you paid for your truth telling and and um, and the lessons you learned from that. So thank yeah, you. Let me add one other thing. Sure. I, think, I think it came to me that, look, you're still in a pretty secure position. Um you're not dealing with an occupation with your home being raided by the military. Uh, look what the Palestinians are facing and what Gaza is facing. And, and that's really humbling. So it was nothing really in comparison to what they are facing uh, that, that I was going through. So again, the Palestinian case puts my life in more perspective and gets me over, oh, woe is me to what am I doing for them? You referred to this a little bit before, but uh, uh, I want you to tease it out more. Uh, you quote Mahmoud Darwish, Palestine as metaphor. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, Darwish says Palestine is really a, a metaphor of the human condition. And he talks about Jesus as a Muslim as being a model, uh, but it's also a, 
a matter of it's a metaphor of justice. It's a metaphor of what peace demands. And again, it's a litmus test. Yeah. You can hold the Palestine case up to Ukraine and see, well, there's a disproportionate amount of armament and weaponry about that war. And we need, I mean, yeah, okay, we need to stop what, what Russia is doing. But at the same time, why is Palestine abandoned? So it's a call to be prophetic and raise the Palestine case and not let it go uh, with our government. Uh, and, and we know that the Biden administration are very much in the Zionist camp. So our work is going to be long and hard. Uh, but, you know, the Palestine case is a metaphor that we hold up to keep calling us, to keep rising up and, and not giving up as Mazen Kamsia and so many other of our friends are, are not giving up. I want to, I mean, you've been sharing personally, Don, but I want to even get more personal now um, Uh oh. with you. <laughs> you know, most of us on this call are friends of yours who've known you for many, many years. And you don't have to talk to you very long uh, before you use the word samud, steadfastness, resilience, perseverance, words that uh, are uh, that that have described you for many of us. It's the words that the Palestinians use, of course, for their own stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israeli oppression. But but you have been a, a model of samud for us, Don. Near the end of the book, you say that the words of the imam after the Sabra and Shatila mass massacre continue to ring in your ears. Please, when you go home, tell people what has happened here. Uh, you, that has remained with you all these years. T t tell us about that. Yeah, it has. Um, and it's a lot to live up to. It's, it's really humbling. I mean, it's, it's guided your life. Well, it has in many ways, at least from that moment in 82. And for those that, well, you see it in the book, but um, with two others, I went back to Beirut uh, after the war and after the PLO withdrew in late August of 82. And we were in the air uh, when Bashir Jamal was killed, uh, the, the uh, elected president and a great friend of Israel, president of Lebanon now. And he was uh, blown up. Eventually, he found out it was, may have been a Syrian group. So we landed in Cyprus because the uh, airport in Beirut was destroyed by Israel. And uh, we hopped in a taxi, and the taxi driver turned on the BBC, and it was the first word of the massacre globally. So he said, you guys are going nowhere. So we got a boat the next day and went in. And uh, we got down to the Middle East Council of Churches office, and Gabi Habib uh, had a bunch of the nurses uh, and the doctors who were working, even in the refugee camps, like Sui Ang, who may be on this call, and Ellen Siegel, who really paid a price. Um, so he said, drop everything, drop your luggage, and get over to the camp. So we went in, and this was the day after. This wasn't even the day uh, that the massacres had just finished. So it was the day after when uh, some of the poor refugees were coming back to see if any of their uh, families survived. They were pulling out pieces of bodies and a number of bodies under the wreckage. And um, this was just gut-wrenching. You had to wear a handkerchief doused in Cologne, cheap Cologne, because the stench of death was overwhelming. It affected all of your senses and everything. And uh, I mean, here, I am just one little Westerner who's gonna go home. Here are these refugees who lost everything. And I was sitting kind of lamenting and watching body bags being carried into a mass grave. And then an imam walked by. So I ran up to him and uh, his English was really good. And uh, I apologized as an American. <laughs> I said, I, I'm so sorry that my country did not live up to its uh, 
the U.S. signed an agreement to protect the Palestinians when the PLO withdrew. We totally failed that. And he said, yes, uh, I accept your apology. You are, but you are an accomplice in, in this destruction. And, uh, and then he said, but thank God you are here. Thank Allah you are here. Just go home and tell what you have seen. So this is our mission, and this has stuck with me. Uh, and, and never to let that go. And this is where Samud comes in. And Samud is what we learn from the Palestinians, that we don't give up. I remember Jonathan Kutab, I had a group in uh, over of students. And on the last day, a couple of the students, we met with Jonathan to debrief. And uh, one of the students said, oh, I'm angry as hell. What am I, I won't be able to talk to my parents, my professors. What am I going to do? And Jonathan basically said, well, we got to figure out what we can say so we can be heard. But he said, as an attorney in the West Bank, I've lost 99% of my cases. But as a person of faith, I'm not called to just be successful. Yeah, I've got to do my best. I'm called to be faithful. And I think that underscores the whole theme of Samud, never surrendering, never giving up, that this is a lifelong uh, commitment. You know, thank you for that, Don. Uh, uh, and those of us who know you know that uh, um, that call has resonated through you to many of us. I'm going to ask you a question now that many, many people I know continue to ask you and can continue to ask many of us who are on the call. Uh, you quote from Mahmoud Darwish again, to be Palestinian means to be infected with incurable hope. Hmm. Which, which brings us to the final lesson to which you point in your conclusion. This is what you write. The difficult challenge of remaining hopeful in the pursuit of justice when the opposition possesses overwhelming military, political, economic, and cybersecurity domination, as well as support from the U.S. empire. And then you give a number of examples, people doing the work. As Mitri Rahib puts it, uh, hope is what you do, what we do together. So Don, uh, uh, for many of us who are facing uphill struggles in our own contexts, talk to us about where you find hope and give us a word of hope. Well, um, again, it's, it's a very humbling uh, thing to um, be called to address uh, because you fail so much at this. Um, we haven't had a lot of victories. But at the same time, I've, I mean, it's not just about me. It, it's a collective thing. You know, I've got my dear Palestinian wife now sitting on the floor smiling at me. We, we share this together. Uh, you find networks uh, so that you can ex deal with your frustration and then find others who are going to share this journey with you. Uh, you just can't do this alone. You've got to find a supportive network. You've, so IPMN, the PIN networks, have been critical in all of this. Our families, uh, prayer, you know, again, for me, this issue of contemplative reflection and listening, uh, to, to take time to stay centered in all this and listen and, and to get the lessons, you know, because we're, this is a learning process. But then, as Mitri says, hope is what you do. Uh, it, it isn't just what you think and hope isn't a, you know, hope isn't kind of, uh, a subjective thing. I think optimism is very subjective that we want to be joyful, happy. Uh, but hope is a much deeper theological and experiential reality. It's grounded in all these things, a collective reality of keeping yourself centered and mindful of your calling. So I go back to the imam, uh, just go and tell the story, but don't give up. And finally, it's the Palestinians we have to look to, listen to. 
and know that we're going to be in solidarity with them and we're not going to abandon them. So, uh, and again, you know, it's, there's a lot of failure in this, but this is part of the process. This is the cross and uh, we carry it uh, with hope. You know, and, and in fact, you give a number of examples after that particular quote uh, <clears throat> in the conclusion of your book. And those examples are some of your Palestinian friends over the years who have uh, who have been models of Samud uh, and faithful witness and resistance, nonviolent resistance uh, to you. And uh, yeah, to the, the model of the Pal our Palestinian friends, right? And our and other voices of conscience in the region. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote the end of your book here, Don. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's a little longer, not, not too long, but a little long. But I want to tell you uh, how moved I was um, by the ending of your book. Um, and you just shared with me beforehand. You know, you're about to turn 80, and you're going to be in Cyprus, and then over in Palestine, Israel again which is wonderful. But let, let me, uh, you, you referenced Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech the night before he died. And, and you talk about where you are in your life now. And th this is what you have to say about yourself. This is my hope and, pr and I, I could, when I read it, I could hear your voice. So I just want you to know it really moved me. Mm. This is my hope and prayer for my life and witness. I have run the race, but have yet to see the defeat of racism and justice for Palestinians and Israelis. These struggles will be long, and I will not live to see them resolved. But that doesn't matter, because it's not about me. What matters is to be faithful to our calling during our lifetime. We have been to the mountaintop, and we can see the promised land of justice off in the distance. It won't be long now. Perhaps the next generation or the one after them. Glory to God in the lowest. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I am. Don, it touched me. It touched me. Yeah, I, I moved as you read it because it's King's speech in Memphis the night before he was killed. Uh, I choke up when he had this premonition uh, that he's not going to get there. But we're on this road together. Uh, we're not going to surrender to the powers of racism, destruction, inhumanity. Uh, but we've got a calling. We, we have a responsibility of solidarity, of giving our best shot at this. Uh, and we're not going to see the solution. You know, I'm not going to see Palestine liberated. But I'm not going to surrender my vision and hope that that's going to happen. Uh, and so I try to do my best. Uh, and this is where I need everyone else to be with me. Uh, you know, it's a collective responsibility. I'm not in it alone. Uh, I am a person of faith, so I am listening to God and getting strength and substance there. But uh, my wife, at times I listen to her. And, <laughs> and uh, but to others, this little community of justice uh, that we depend on, and we just need to build it and find it and stay the course. And then to stay in touch with Palestine. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's all about that hope beyond hope, uh, a far deeper reality and what we really do to embrace and embody that. Don, you've been, uh, um, we're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I do have a couple more questions, but um, Pauline Kaufman, our, our dear mutual friend, just uh, recommended that a copy of your book uh, should be given to every, every seminarian. Uh, you've been such a mentor to so many of us and dear friend, and I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if uh, what, what kind of plans you have. You did share with me that you're going to be on a, a speaking tour. You want to you wanna say a few words about that, and then we'll try to wrap up. Yeah, I figure there's a short window when you get a book out. Um, and uh, who knows how it's going to go, but I give it, give it my best shot. 
So um, I'm going to be going to Boston and Harvard and um, the Palestine Museum um, right after Labor Day, then be in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're we're going to have a focus on, I think it's Thursday the 14th or 15th, um, on the Cyber Shatila Massacre. And one of the survivors will be there, and Ellen Siegel will be there, and then I'll share my reflections. And... Uh, so on and on it goes. I'm going to end up in the Bay Area and uh, just try my best. Oh, Seattle. Mark is just reminding me. Mark and I will be <laughs> in Seattle honoring Dick Toll and uh, my friend. Another Doug giant. Dick. Another giant, Dick Toll. Yeah. And uh, we're going to try to do a book thing there. So um, it's really friends from across the years who are going to help me with this. And you just do your best and get it out. And if this book is helpful, well, praise God. If, uh, if it moves some people to get deeper into justice and learn the Palestine issue and liberation theology, uh, settler colonial, uh, colonialism, and uh, this long process of learning I've been on, uh, so be it. But the book is just a vehicle, you know, to proclaim the kingdom and the calling to justice. Well, Don, uh, um, uh, we're all moved by your witness and your life's work. Um, so, Don, uh, uh, really, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I want to give you an opportunity to share any closing words uh, uh, for us. Well, thanks, Mike, and I apologize again for the terrible sound in the beginning. Well, we appreciate uh, everybody staying uh, staying yeah, on thank and you. Uh, sticking with us. Uh, the yeah. last uh, 45 minutes to an hour have been really, really good. So thanks, Don. Yeah, and thanks to all of you. Please, Don, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and all the friends down there. There's a lot of hope here. Uh, while it gets worse, and it's going to get worse in Palestine, uh, there will be more closures, more attacks, more murders. But this is what we are called to uh, stand up to. And like the Sheikh told me, just keep telling what is going on, what you have seen, and uh, what you know. So may we just really be inspired not to give up, uh, keep hope alive, but uh, do it by what you do and sacrifice for justice in Palestine. So thank you all for hanging on and being with us. And uh, may you all be renewed and inspired to keep the journey. And I'll hopefully cross paths with you one way or another.